welcome to Doing Diversity in Writing, the show where we as writers explore expanding and improving the depth, breadth, and representation of our characters in fiction. My name is Bethany Ann Tucker, and with me is Mar- Marielle S. Smith. <laughs> um, so this is our first episode. Are you excited? <laughs> I'm nervous. Uh, Yeah, I am excited, but I'm also very nervous because we've been working on this project for so long. It's been it's it's been a year almost. Um, Not quite a year. No, but almost. And and there's been so much behind the scenes work. And now we're finally getting into recording. So, yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm excited, but I'm also nervous. Nervous is okay. We can do this. Uh, I'm excited we're doing this. I'm very much about close your eyes, jump on the plane. You got to keep moving. (laughs) I mean, that's how I got to China the first time. I was so scared getting on the plane. I closed my eyes and put my foot inside the plane without looking. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of how I do it. (laughs) That reminds me, like, I'm I'm more of a uh, Elizabeth Gilbert. You can jump, but make sure there's a safety net. Like a sweet mattress down at the bottom (laughs) of the cliff. So... (laughs) You know, I mean, the- yeah, I haven't always had those around, okay. but like you said, this has been a long time coming and yeah. we've put in a lot of work um, and there's been a lot of people who've been really supportive and we're excited to finally be getting this out to everyone. Yes. Um, since this is our first episode, um, we're going to be doing some introducing about the show, what the goals are, what you as the listeners can expect to hear going forward. Um, and I guess we'll just start with who this is for. So while we might wish for everyone to listen, even though I think that would scare us very much if everyone was listening. (laughs) Yes, very much so. Um, Yeah. While we do wish that everyone would listen, we are really talking to writers, specifically writers who want to write characters who may not look and sound or live like the writers themselves which most of us already do as we write, because we don't just write characters with the same gender upbringing, living in the same environment, et cetera, as us. But we often don't think think about the diversity inclusion until it's something quote unquote bigger, like a significant disability that, or a skin color that we don't have, or an identity marker that's political that we don't personally identify with. Mm-hmm. So I've heard this from a lot of people. I'm sure you've heard this as well, Marielle, um, that it can be scary. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, as writers, we're doing this, we're walking out on a limb, we're writing a character that doesn't look like us in a significant, obvious way. And we might think, oh, what are people going to think of me? What if I get it wrong? Am I going to offend somebody? And we get it. Marielle and I, we get it. So yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We spent a lot of time thinking about it, doing it, et cetera. So we're going to talk about both the fear and also most importantly, the hows of actually going about doing more inclusive writing. So I'm not going to keep talking all of this by myself. Um, Marielle, could you explain a little bit about how we started working on this together and why? Because it, it really did start with you. Yes, it did. So uh, quite a while back, I wrote some blog posts on diversity in writing um, with the intent to one day turn those into a book. And when I say quite a while back, I'm talking years. Um, My background is in gender and post-colonial studies, and I've always wanted to make that bridge, right, Um, from the theoretical to the practical. So since I gained most of my knowledge on representation within academia um, as a student and as a teacher, I realized I needed to get myself a co-writer who was aware of these discussions, but not as knee deep in theory as I was, kind of to help me translate all that knowledge into concrete advice. And then I saw you, Bethany, uh, I saw you give a talk uh, the summer of 2020 on how to self-edit for structure. And this included a segment on diversity. And just the way you talked about and structured those topics, that that made me go, yeah, this is my person. I'm going to ask you. Uh, I'm going to ask you if you want to work with me on this project. I'm so glad I came across as well prepared because I went into surgery the day after you saw me give that talk. (laughs) I remember that, yeah. 
Yeah, so I'm really excited to be working on this project with you. Um, and I think, shall we talk a little bit about who we are and how we relate to diversity, kind of give everyone listening some context on where we're talking from, and then mm-hmm. get into what this means for listeners and where it's all going? Yeah, let's do that. All right, so I'm nominating you first since I did the intro. Okay, um, so I was born and raised in the Netherlands by a Dutch mom and a Scottish dad, but I currently live in Cyprus, which is a tiny island in the Mediterranean Sea. My relationship to representation is both academic and personal. I am a white queer woman. I'm childless by choice. I'm a feminist. Um, I have crippling social anxiety. I'm a vegan. I volunteer for a cat charity. I'm also a Reiki master and a magnified healing practitioner. And I love tarot and oracle cards and crystals, to name just a few of my identity markers. Yeah, so I'm just a bit jealous of your crystal collection. Just as saying. you should, as you should. Um, but yes, I, I remember how being white was very much a privilege growing up. Like so many of my classmates, I was a second generation migrant to the Netherlands because of my dad. But I was never told, go back to your country. Instead, like I'm, what I'm saying is my, my classmates were told, go back to your country. Um, like my Turkish and Moroccan uh, classmates. So instead, in my case, people thought it was cute. I had a foreign parent and they squealed over my gorgeous ginger hair, right? Um, And it wasn't until I started taking courses in gender studies and on post-colonial theory that I found a vocabulary to talk about these things. So eventually I ended up teaching about the politics of representation in the gender studies department at Utrecht University. And for almost a decade, I taught everything from complete courses on the topic to guest lectures on what the politics of representation is and why it matters. Um, that is until I left the Netherlands and moved to Cyprus. And so now you get to see all these topics and how they work together from a different location, a different perspective, don't you? Yeah, it's, it's quite an experience uh, moving from the first country to ever legalize gay marriage uh, 20 years ago to a country where they've only introduced civil partnership for same-sex couples five years ago. Like there's no gay marriage. And um, like my girlfriend won't hold my hand in public nor introduce me to her parents as, as her partner. That's, that's the really kind of country, different. That's the, yeah, that's the kind of country I live in right now. Um, so how about you? Uh, let's see. So I was born in San Diego, USA, not far from the Mexican-American border. I currently live in the state of Georgia on the East Coast, all the way across the country from that. But there have been a lot of different homes in between a few different countries as well. Um, I just came to Georgia and it's COVID, so I'm not really getting out. And I can't tell you much about Georgia other than I now own a house here. So um, I'm bisexual, polyamorous, pagan, uh, wicked, druidic, aligned in my spiritual practices. I'm definitely a feminist. Um, I have an invisible disability and I am married to a black man in the U.S. uh, in relationship with another person of color as well. Ironically, I can usually pass and not be recognized for any of these identities if I choose. And it's both a privilege in some situations and a real frustration in others. Um, When I was a child, uh, my family joined an extreme fundamentalist organization, basically a cult. Um, And uh, I'm very vocal about that now. Our literature consumption was, uh, yeah, it was a highly controlled, is to put it lightly, um, story. And the stories that we imbibed were of the utmost concern for the leadership in this organization. They understood powerfully um, the impact and significance of story. And they wanted to make sure that we only took in the kind of story they wanted us to have. Um, but it was story, unsurprisingly, that helped me read my way out of those lasting beliefs and public libraries. I was getting my hands on books. People didn't know I was reading. Um, and, and in a way, my family as well started reading other books. And I would say, significantly for myself and a little bit for my parents as well we read our way out of this lifestyle and away from the cult-like activities I'm definitely far far away from that all of us now and I'm very happy about it 
So I would like to say I read my way to freedom and story is very important to me. <laughs> I love that. I think that is true for so many of us, right? Which is why representation matters and also why good representations matter because not all representations are created equally. Exactly. Yeah, I really, I really feel that. It wasn't until I went to college when I was invited to a special pre-freshman year, uh, like a pre-orientation. So you had orientation, but for people that were at risk, you went to a pre-orientation, got like extra orientation. Um, and I was invited to a pre-orientation um, that where words like race and representation were openly used um, that week definitely changed my life. Almost all the students in this at-risk pre-orientation were people of color, and they talked openly about their lives. I mean, like 37 of the 40 people there were people of color. Um, so a year later, I began dating one of the young men I met at this pre-o, um, who is now my husband. And as a biracial couple in the U.S., race and representation isn't something we can ever forget about. It affects how we dress when we're traveling together, when, where we choose to travel, the people who become our friends, it makes a difference in the medical care we receive. It has affected my relationships with members of my extended family, though I'm happy to say most of them have come over and been won over by now. Took a while. Um, it regulates. Patience. Yes, patience is key when you're introducing people to new ideas. Don't just get mad at people right away. Give them time. Yes. Um, but, you know, who we are and our identities, it, re it regulates where my husband's likely to find a job. We've moved many times just to find him a job um, in positions of respect and responsibility in his chosen career. And this is all because of story. It really is the story that people think of when they see him, when they see us together and what they assume about us. Right. And that's, of course, like, that's because there aren't enough stories, good stories, about Black men, interracial couples, and so on. Like, the representations out there are so limited, it's no wonder people don't know how to deal with or respond to those who they perceive as different, right? They have very limited and often negative images in their heads, which are then applied to everyone under that same umbrella. That's really how representation works and why it's so important that we get better at it. Yeah, yeah. And just talking about myself and representation, I haven't even gone to gone into what it was like to work abroad, both with my husband and then by myself as a white woman, um, teaching English in Asia and cross-cultural communication. But that's all story for another time. Uh, I think that's enough about me. Marielle, I'm curious about how all these identities and perspectives influence you as a reader and a writer. Though I should also say editor and writing coach as well, because I can't imagine that doesn't come over into those areas. We're both involved in supporting writers, so. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, so let's see. Um, so while I was still teaching representation at the university, I started my own editing company. Um, and as an editor, I always pay attention to lack of representation and how the diverse characters who are there come across on the page. There are quite a few books out there that don't perpetuate certain stereotypes and even books that turn entire stereotypes on their head after I pointed out certain issues. Um, and that makes me a very happy editor. Um, as a writer, I try to pay attention to these issues as well, of course. Like I co-wrote a lesbian a trilogy of novellas um, and we broke a few known romance rules precisely because we were annoyed by certain patterns and expectations in the romance genre. Uh, so we wanted to write more realistic books. Um, and when I look back, all the stories I wrote from like my teen teenage years on, they included characters from all races and sexualities as well. So like I said, I really didn't have the words at the time to discuss issues of representation. But when I look at like, <laughs> I'm sure you have the same goes for you, like the old floppy disks and stuff. With yeah. The old writing. Yeah. When I yeah, look at that. Yeah, they're in the that, boxes behind me. <laughs> yeah. So I got rid of the floppy disks. They're all, I, I, I saved them all on my external hard drive now. Um, but when I finally got rid of my last computer that had a floppy disk. But like when I go through that, I'm like, it's so obvious that I was concerned with the absence of certain people in the books that I read that I wanted to create a space for them. So, yeah, I really cannot wait to dive into the topic and discuss it with a wider audience. Um, how has it influenced your writing and your editing? Well, 
first I'd like to just say, you know, I find it interesting that some of the books you've edited changed just because you mentioned it, because so often it's not that people want to perpetuate a stereotype or want to like leave people out. They're just unaware. Yeah. And for me, that's very hopeful because if you just say something, it it can change. Not always, like you said, like what you said, right? Patience is needed. Uh, Yes. Like I do often get a little bit of people pushing back or they are a bit offended because they think I'm saying they're a racist or something. Right. Um, So I have to be, I I have to try to really carefully around that. But once I make them see my point and I just give suggestions on, okay, so this is, you know, this is how you could, it's a very simple change. It becomes like, it becomes an entirely different book. Um, So yeah, it's, it's, uh, but but you know that as an editor that you you have to have a certain language, which you try to explain certain ideas, whether that is why a comma is needed here or there, or uh, why certain prose doesn't work or a certain setting, or why a certain character doesn't work, you do need to use a particular kind of vocabulary. Uh, And I think if you do it right, yeah, once people understand, they're like, oh, I had no idea. And then they change it. Yeah. I mean, half the job of an editor, I personally think, is communicating the issues to the writer. Because mm-hmm. once they understand it, so often we all just want to be able to do better. But if you just yeah. like write red ink all over it, be like, this is bad. That doesn't actually help anybody. You're not being an editor. You're just being a critic. Yes. And that's not helpful. <laughs> no. So going back to your question, because I totally skipped it for a minute. Sorry about that. Um, like I said, I read my way out of bigotry and ignorance and, um, my first published book, which has since been unpublished because it seriously needs a developmental editor. I did not know what I didn't know back then. Um, that book included a polytriad. Um, it was something I included instinctively and I had no language for it at the time. And it wasn't until I started researching to find out if like this had ever happened in history that I ran into the concept and that this was actually something that people did fairly frequently. And that for me, writing that book, it blew open the doors to learning and unlearning so much. Um, Let's see, as Mustang Rabbit, that's my pen name for YA fantasy. uh, I write a series centered around a young woman who comes to identify as gender fluid and is decidedly bisexual. Um, it's been a challenge writing, um, these identities without access to the language used today, because it's set in like a medieval fantasy period. So I can't use all this language. She has to navigate it. And it's like, even like Mm -hmm. the she, he pronouns, like where she's at, like she's very flexible with those as she's trying to figure it out. Um, so that's been a challenge that's been fun to do, uh, scary at times, but a lot of fun. And, and then as Sierra Darren, which is my epic fantasy pen name, I write decidedly darker themes and deal with um, concepts of racism, prejudice, feminism, equality, and religion. There's been a lot of fear involved in writing this series. Um, And essentially this research fear, the the challenge around this is what this podcast is for, like dealing with that and be able to come through it as a writer, get it on the page and actually publish your book. So not to go too long on that, do we want to talk about where we're going with all this? Yes. So the ultimate aim behind the podcast is to eventually write a reference book for fiction writers. We want to include a list of stereotypes, cliches, and tropes that are considered outdated or harmful or counterproductive in any way. And we want to provide positive examples and tips and tricks of how to write diverse characters in ways that do not perpetuate set stereotypes, cliches, and tropes. Basically, how we can write them better. Yeah, so we want to cover the do's and don'ts and the figuring it out between in the middle that exists. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, And the do's and don'ts are flexible in some cases, so we'll talk about that too. Yeah. But um, we want to do this in a way to support and help, not in a way to scare you off so badly that you're willing to give up before you even try. This is possible to do, and we just want to take the fear out of it as much as possible. Um, we really, what we really want to achieve through this podcast, which is basically our rough draft and <laughs> yes. go back to writing language. This is our very polished rough draft of the book and to, to encourage people. So with the podcast in the book, to encourage people to achieve writing more inclusive stories with more diversity, and more complexity. 
Yeah. So in short, to give you like a concrete idea, what we're aiming for to write is a book that works something like this. Let's say you're including a character who has ADHD. You go to that specific chapter in the book. Here you'll find an overview of what kind of representations um, around ADHD are considered harmful, what's considered a better practice, and what are the uh, questions you have to keep in mind as you write this particular character, what things do you have to research, etc. And we really want to encourage writers to become more inclusive in their writing by providing them with a tool to do so in an informed manner. Yeah, we are not going to write a book of that intensity and detail overnight. This is going to be a lot of work. It's going to take a while. Exactly. And this is why we're starting the podcast to keep on track. Um, this is hard, scary work to do. I mean, imagine write, wanting to write uh, diverse characters. Imagine doing a podcast and writing a book on how to write diverse characters. That's scary stuff. Um, and that's exactly the kind of work in danger of ending up at the bottom of my to-do list. If it terrifies me, no matter how hard I want to do it, it will end up at the bottom. <laughs> Slides so, off the side of the desk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That that has happened with this project a few times as well. And then I was like looking around for something else. And I was like, oh, yeah, I was going to do this. Um, but uh, all, all joking aside, right? I, I mean, I have been wanting to write this book for five years, I think. Uh, and this is another reason why I wanted to involve you because I know you to be very on it and I really need some accountability here. Otherwise this book is not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I get it. So one of the reasons we're doing this in the form of the podcast first is because it will keep us accountable. It's that kind of that, that weekly monthly thing of, Oh, we need to get the next episode out. Um, we're both active writers and editors on our own time. So we wanted to make sure we stayed and having that support, as Marielle said, really helps. But we also don't want to write a book literally about everyone in a vacuum of just both of our heads, just the two of us in our immediate circle of friends, family and colleagues. Even for us, with the circles we have, that's pretty diverse. We still didn't want to do it in a vacuum. Exactly. Like we, we would love some contribution and we already have a way for people to start doing that. Yes. So all you have to do, dear listeners, is to go to representationmatters.art, that's A-R-T instead of dot com. Scroll down to the bottom of most of any page, definitely the first page, and there will be a link to two questionnaires that we would love for you to fill out so that you can contribute to this podcast, to this work, and just start to be involved. Yes, and one of the questionnaires will ask you about your experiences around diversity as a writer, and the other one will ask you uh, questions about your experiences with diversity as a reader. And, you know, if you're a writer, you're also a reader, so they're both very relevant to us. Um, and you don't even have to share a name or even an email address. And even if you do, we'll keep your name out of it if we use anything you share, which kind of goes without saying, but we have to say it anyway, right? Yes. Yes, we do. And you can share it with other, with your friends, too. They don't even have to listen to the podcast. Oh, yes. Oh, that's a good one. Yes, because we really. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Share. Share the questionnaires, even if they're not listening to the podcast. Share it with your fellow because your friends will be readers and also share it with your fellow write, writer friends. Right. Um, OK, so let's dig into some of the foundational questions and set this thing up. Yes, let's do it. All right, I'll jump straight into our first bullet point here. And will you go ahead and cover whatever I miss? Yeah, go for it. All right. So here we go. Why does this conversation around writing diversity in fiction even matter? So this might seem like a no brainer to a lot of you listeners, or you might actually have some strong feelings about this. Both are okay. Um, I know for me, this started hitting my radar as a writer around the time I discovered Kindle boards back in 2010, 2011. And every now and then someone would jump on and ask, can I write this? Or how can I write this? And I, I saw a lot of people saying things like, I don't think I'll write characters that are different than me. Uh, I won't do them justice. It makes me uncomfortable. I, I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> I wonder whether they'll dare to listen to our podcast. Well, I, I think some of them would want to. I mean, that's one of the things that got me thinking about this before you even approached me, but I hadn't thought of a book before you suggested it. And I was very frustrated reading all these comments. Um, 
my husband, who, as I mentioned before, is black, rolled his eyes so hard when I told him about these things the authors were choosing not to include in their books. Um, and so this 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 fear, this choice not to include things as you're writing, it leads to even less representation. Um, if authors are choosing to write worlds that only have characters that look like them, it's not even a real world. Um, oh. Like I was living in Japan, in South Korea around the time I started seeing this happen and then later China. So I was like, come on people, the world is so much bigger. Um, and most of us already write characters that are different genders from ourselves. Like you very rarely read a book that only has men or only has women in it. Um, and people have different jobs than us, different social economic backgrounds, educational backgrounds. We already do this when we write. Can you just, I just don't want to, I'm just imagining, like, can you imagine that you have characters like uh, Ernest Hemingway, right? And, and, and he's like, oh, oh, here's this woman character. And he just sort of like calls or writes to a, a female writer friend. And he's like, can you write this bit for me? <laughs> Can you, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just seeing it now. I'm like, we I've, know that's I've, not happening, right? We know I've it's actually, not happening. I've actually had guys approach me and ask if I would like write the female bits in their books. And my, my response was always, you can do it. You well, can I mean, really do it. I mean, there are people who co-write a book with like uh, every chapter is a different perspective, but that's a different story. That That is very different. And yeah. it is. I'm not making fun of anyone that would approach me and say, can you help me do this? Can you advise me on it? But I'm not going to write your book for you just because you want a female character and you don't know how to write it yourself. I'm really like, well, that's how you become a writer. Learn how to do it. Research people. Research. Yes. I write plenty of male characters and guys don't tell me that I write them badly. So my husband's very honest. He would tell me. He would definitely <laughs> tell me. Um, okay. Sorry. Com so going back to why this is important, uh, being able to read stories as a reader. So think of yourself as a reader for a second. Being able to read stories about people who resonate with you or who you identify with is one of the best feelings in the world. When I was a girl, almost every book I wrote, read was about a boy and his horse or a boy and his dog. And I would retell myself the stories, putting a girl in it just because it annoyed me so much as like a six-year-old. So it's, it's about having visibility. It's about recognition as you're enjoying your literature, about feeling heard and seen and being normal, having your own self normalized. If all you ever read is stories about people who are nothing like you, who have nothing in common with you, who grow up in families and surroundings that are nothing like you, it can make you feel like your experiences, your feelings, even your entire being are, are at odds with how the world functions. And and that you don't match up with who matters in that world. And as I buy books for my nieces and nephews, I'm really, really aware of this because mm -hmm. most of them are people of color. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, the opposite situation is also an issue, right? If you only experience characters who look and sound like you and never anything else, that makes for a rather limited worldview. And as the like very Dutch saying, um, what a farmer doesn't know, they won't eat, right? So that means that everything that's that's different remains scary and something that you need to stay away from. And if the only representations of difference you do come across are negative ones, that's a problem as well because it influences how we are amongst each other in the world. Exactly. So much that. Yeah. And besides, you know, being exposed to people who are not like you in whatever way creates normalcy. Like the reality we see around us starts in our minds. And by reading better representations about those we don't know much about, who we perceive as different from us, that's how these identities are humanized. It creates empathy, it creates compassion. And I would say it could eventually lead to a more just society. Yes, I would certainly agree with all of my like intercultural communication work that I've done, like just normalizing the fact that the world can be more than one thing makes such yeah. a difference. And so, like I said before, I, I read my way to freedom. That was how I got my representation. It wasn't in my social circles that I experienced it until I got to college. Thank goodness for public libraries. Like I will always, always support public libraries. Um, and 
it was who I met and it's who we meet on the pages of our fiction books. It, it matters. Like they've, they've proven that like when you dream, things are really, really real. And like your brain experiences it for real. And reading is similar to that. It goes into your head and becomes a reality for you. Yeah. So, and it, every part of diversity, it doesn't have to be written by someone who holds that identity. It doesn't. Um, otherwise you'd have, you'd have to read so many books to cover all of them and you wouldn't have natural looking societies. So we don't say that men can only write men or women can only write women. Um, and I think that philosophy, like if we can do it on a fundamental level of gender, that philosophy should extend to other identity markers as well. Mm -hmm. So getting back to the subject, um, since representation is so big and complicated, we're going to break it down a bit. Um, so Mariel, I've been talking a lot. Do you want to tackle the three levels of diversity in, in the book publishing era, uh, arena? I, I can talk. I swear I can. <laughs> sure. Um, well, so there's three levels, right? So there's the level of publishing professionals, the level of authors, and then there's the level of characters. So if we start with the publishing one, this level speaks to the world of corporate organization, like who's involved in the company's publishing book and also the processes of book selection and preparation. Like how diverse are the agents, editors, and so on? Who works where in publishing companies? Who are the executives and decision makers? How diverse are they? How many of them are men? How many are women? How many are white? How many are black, indigenous, or of color? How many are cisgender? How many are transgender? How many are non-binary? How many of them are able-bodied and how many aren't? How many are dealing with um, mental disabilities? How many are straight? How many fall somewhere under the LGBTQIA plus umbrella? Who are the ones at the bottom of the hierarchy? And so on. And also how are they paid in comparison? Like, do they get the same benefits? And this matters because these people, these organizations are the gatekeepers that present media to so many people. They're the ones that put the books in Costco and Barnes and Nobles and mm -hmm. all the other books in other countries that I'm not personally familiar with. They literally yeah. craft reading experiences and realities to some extent. They do, uh, which is why it's important to ask these questions. So the second level is that of authors. How diverse are the authors publishing right now? You, you can pretty much ask the same questions we just asked for the level of publishing, right? Like how many women, how many men, how many of them white, black, indigenous, of color, cis, trans, non-binary, and so on. So what are their advances in comparison? How much do they get for speaking events, etc.? cetera? The um, publishing paid me hashtag has been really enlightening over the past year or so. Like yeah, people, writers being honest about the advances they got and stuff, yeah. Every time people start being honest about how much they're paid, at least in the U.S., like things hit the fan. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I was just going to say all hell breaks loose. Yes. So this is another place where numbers and institutional practices really need to be clearly examined. Book advances are often calculated based on previous sale numbers. But if a book is, say, by a Kenyan immigrant author um, previously didn't have much of a sales push before, those historic those historical sales numbers will be low and the algorithm advance, the algorithm, algorithmic advance suggested by quote unquote, the machine, the computers that run these numbers will be very low to match those historical sales numbers when compared to perhaps like a white retired military officer where a bunch of those books have sold really well historically. Mm -hmm. Or if a book has never been published by an author on this particular subject matter by this particular identity, um, then again, the advance might be quite low because the historic number is zero. Yeah, which, which you know, just goes to show that this fight for diversity needs to happen on multiple levels. Um, the last of which is that of characters who are present within works of fiction and who is absent, if present, how are diverse characters represented? So this, this third level, this is the level of our podcast. This is uh, the level that uh, we will be focusing on in the book we aim to publish. Yes. So when it comes to the other levels, I'm going to recommend Minorities in Publishing podcast. Jen Baker mm -hmm. does a really enlightening and engaging interview with publishing professionals and authors of all identities over there on that podcast. 
Um, so we're not going to jump into that here. We're just going to be talking about the actual writing, the actual doing of representation on the page. And I think that is quite enough for us to try to tackle. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think so too. So yeah, that's what we're going to explore, like the writing of different identities and everything then everything that's related to that topic, like the question, what types of characters aren't visible in works of fiction? Or at least not visible enough to y- yet really make an impact. There is no way we can read every book out there. So saturation is definitely an issue. Yes, it is. Um, And we'll also discuss the quality of the representation's presence. Just because a certain identity is present doesn't mean it's a positive one. Um, So we'll ask questions like, do these representations actually serve the communities uh, they represent? And this is really important, which is why we'll be diving into annoying or harmful stereotypes and looking at cliches and looking at what are better practices that are possible. Mm -hmm. So like we said, right, what are the do's and don'ts of writing diverse characters in your work, whether they are diverse in terms of uh, race, gender, ethnicity, class, sexuality, religion, origin, ability, age, appearance. With so many bad examples out there, how do we do diversity right or better? in our own work? How can we make sure that when we include a diverse set of characters into our writing, that we won't be doing more harm than good? All right. So let's handle some brass tacks. I think I've already given my opinion on this, but let's really talk about it. Who gets to write what kind of characters? Do we write what we know or can we write what we don't know? Are we allowed to write characters from communities we don't belong to? Yes. And, and you know, you, you, knew, you knew I agreed with you, uh, but here's why. Think about this question for a second, right? Have you ever written a character who is unlike you in any kind of way? You know, perhaps they had a different gender or they came from a different class. Maybe they held a different job, got a different degree or grew up in radically different circumstances like with or without divorced parents, just to name something. If you have and I cannot imagine that you haven't, then that already answers that question. Like I said before, it would be incredibly limiting to only write characters who are like you. Yes, it would. So like have to put a character in a room and lock the door. (laughs) Yes, right? So we both believe that anyone can write about pretty much anything. And that includes the kinds of characters they wish to write about. As long, and this is the disclaimer, (laughs) as long as it's done in an informed, sensitive, and sensible manner, which is precisely why we're doing this podcast and why we want to write a reference book to help anyone wanting to write diverse characters with this. Yes. And if the reason you're wondering whether you have to write diverse characters, um, like if you're afraid of making mistakes, then that's what this podcast is for too, to lower that threshold of trepidation, to lessen that fear. We want to give you tools and pointers to figure out how best to write the diverse characters in your own stories. And besides, isn't it always better to at least have tried? I mean, even if you do slip up somewhere, that can be a learning moment. We just have to bring enough grace to our attempts and to other people's attempts so we can get up, dust ourselves off and try again to be better at it. Yes. And like for some, this might be a huge learning curve, but you're never going to learn if you quit after you first fail. Also, don't forget that being able to walk away from this challenge and not engage with it because you're afraid of doing it wrong, that carries privilege. It's up to all of us to create a better world, not just those who have to deal with a lack of representation and misrepresentation on a daily basis. In fact, I believe it only makes sense if we use the privilege we have to create a better world for all. Yes, all of this. And I'm going to speak directly from what my husband and my boyfriend, who's also a person of color, have told me many times. It's exhausting to be a minority. And as I've been more out about my more minority status, I can speak to it as well. And I'm sure you can talk to some of it, especially when someone can't pass under casual review, like I can most of the time, unless I'm with my husband. Um, So like I can be poly and bi and on the Wiccan Druidic spectrum of spirituality and nobody has to know about it. Like when my extremely conservative Christian friend from my mother's high school days visited our home unexpectedly, I just slipped my pentacle necklace under the collar of my shirt and said nothing to keep the peace. 
mm-hmm. but my husband can't change the color of his skin when he shows up for a job interview. Right. Like to most people, I don't look particularly queer, so I can pass as straight in potentially hostile situations with ease. But like you said, if you're black or Asian or more obviously queer or very uh, or visibly disabled, that's like not an option. Sure. Like people assuming that I'm straight is very tiring and it doesn't suddenly give me the right to marry my girlfriend where we live right now. But it's not near as exhausting as being under scrutiny all the time because you so obviously don't belong to the norm. Yeah. And unless I'm actively having a seizure, I don't have to worry about that most of the time. Here's the thing. Visible and invisible minorities are rightly tired of having the conversation of of educating all the time. There is enough literature out there, enough podcasts, enough books, videos, TikTok videos, even um, articles, etc., that that more privileged people or people not of that particular minority can read, can educate them. And they should be taking on some of the burden. We all should be taking shouldering some of this burden for each other. Or if you're very, very privileged, just shoulder some of it that you haven't had to before. Just Mm -hmm. because you're not really a minority doesn't mean you can't or shouldn't talk about these things. It is okay um, to take part in the fight yourself. It's an emotional labor that's expected of the quote unquote oppressed to always be educating the unoppressed about being oppressed. And isn't that an irony? (laughs) It is. So when multiple male doctors years ago were writing me off as a hysterical woman for my health issues that were undiagnosed, um, and when my husband was getting turned away from jobs because he passed all the interviews, but when they saw his face, they suddenly stopped talking to him, neither he nor I had the energy to champion for like better hiring practices, hire a lawyer, pay for more expensive doctors. We were a little bit too concerned with trying to figure out how we were going to pay rent each month than to like, quote unquote, get into that fight. Mm -hmm. But I think that's exactly what a lot of people with privilege seem to be missing, that you can actually educate yourself. You can do that emotional labor yourself. Like we've asked ourselves as well, whether we two white women are the best people to talk about how to do diversity in writing. But first of all, diversity is not just about race, although a lot of people seem to think it is. Um, And secondly, what were we going to do? Wait for a couple of Black women writers to show up and do the work for us, knowing that they are already fighting their own fights? Exactly. So one more point before we go. This is a global podcast. Marielle and I are on opposite sides of the world from each other, and we will try to cover as much ground as we can. But as you're listening, think about how these issues apply to your own location, your own culture, country, language literary canon, etc. If your home is in Shanghai, the dominant people group will probably be Han Chinese, not white Americans. So we'll translate as much as we're able, but we're also going to need a little help from you guys, you listeners on the other end, to translate it into your own particular situation. Definitely. And and this is part of the education process, the fun. Uh, I'm I'm still a teacher at heart. Um, (laughs) Never going to go away. Nope. For either of us. Yes. Nope. So this is like, this is the fun, right? Taking the concepts we'll be going over and then applying them to your own situation Agreed. and to your own, and to your own writing. Yeah. You need to need the Play-Doh a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about what's coming up next. Um, during our first season, we'll be laying the foundation for foundations for exploring representation. So topics that we'll dive into and explore further during those episodes are why this conversation matters. Uh, We'll dive more deeply into this in the next episode. Uh, We'll talk about common fears and frustrations about representing diverse characters. We'll have an episode on cultural appropriation, one on how representation actually works. Um, We'll talk about the most common pitfalls when representing diverse characters. We'll also discuss diversity within diversity And we'll be talking about the marking of the unmarked in our writing. Yes. And then after we've laid these foundational episodes in our first season, um, in the next seasons coming afterwards, we'll break things down into various identity identity markers and include points on how they intersect as we move through them. So if you're worried that we won't cover the kind of character you're trying to write in your work, give us a shout. Um, we'll probably get there at some point, but you, if you never know, if we hear a lot of requests for a particular 
um, group of characters or particular kind of question, we'll probably get it to it faster if you say something. Yes. Um, but yeah, what you said, like covering all of this is going to take us a while. So uh, uh, do be patient. But like you said, if there's something in particular you want us to talk about, do shout. Because um, yeah, that will move it up. On yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to it. How about you? It's going to be a lot of work. Um, yeah, like it, it's going to be a lot of work, but we're both in, in this for the long haul. So yeah, I'm, 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 I'm very much looking forward to it and I'm looking forward to our next episode. Same. So thank you everyone for listening. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Bye.